She said, hold on, hold on, let me get your uncle on the phone. My uncle gets on the phone and he's, oh, Anna, we are so happy you've been found. Do you know who you are? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm Sarah. He says, you are part of a royal family. Your great grandfather was a paramount chief. Your grandfather, you can be chief someday. You are a princess in this country. Welcome to Beyond Speaking with Brian Lord, a podcast featuring deeper conversations with the world's top speakers. Hi, I'm Brian Lord, and welcome to the Beyond Speaking podcast. Our guest today is Princess Sarah Culberson. She's got an extraordinary journey that's been featured on CNN, GMA, BBC, among others worldwide. She's an internationally known thought leader, artist, and educator whose work uh, addresses biracial and cultural identity and raises awareness of issues impacting Sierra Leone. So Sarah, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Of course. Thank you so much for having me. It's great to be with you. So you've got this amazing story that, (laughs) you know, just because you're a kid growing up in West Virginia, and how do you go from that to finding out that you're Princess Sarah. Like, we're, like it's one of those things that's just amazing. Obviously, it's, it's this amazing story. They're making a movie out of it. Um, you know, where does that story kind of begin for you? You know, I'm thinking, where does it begin? So I'm thinking about when I was first adopted as a little one. And the first day I came home to meet my family and I was, gosh, it was three days after my first birthday. And, um, so I was with my birth mother for nine months, then I was in foster care for three months, then adopted into this beautiful, loving, all white family, as you mentioned in West Virginia. And, um, you know, to go from that life growing up, not really looking like everyone, but still being surrounded by love. And then to years later, meet my birth family in the entire tribe. It was a whole, like a whole new world actually emerged. Really, really, truthfully, it's like this whole new world opened up and um, it was really quite beautiful. One thing that's popping into my head is when I was adopted and came home the first day, I was wearing this green dress. Mm -hmm. And when I met my birth father years later, he gave me this beautiful African green dress and he had a matching green shirt. And when I arrived in the village, all the women in the village welcomed me and they were singing and dancing and everyone parted and the women came forward wearing the same green dress that I had been given. And they were singing in Mende, my birth family's language, we're preparing for Sarah. So I, that's just popping into my head, like the synergy between green in my life, the beginning and meeting my birth family and really having this whole new outlook on life about growing up in this wonderful family as a child and then moving into this whole new world in Sierra Leone, West Africa, seeing what happened after an 11 year civil war Mm. and the realities of things that I used to think were, Oh, I'm having a rough day after going to Sierra Leone and seeing what people went through. It gave me a whole new context on life about what's important and what's not. Right now in the news is Ukraine and Russia and everything Mm. else as we record this. Um, you really, it kind of really helps you focus on what's the, what the most important thing is. You know, I took high school students to Sierra Leone and high school students are extraordinary. They're such wonderful teachers, students, young people, period. Mm-hmm. Um, but I took a group of high school students to Sierra Leone and they came back and they gave a presentation and they said, Catherine, her name is Catherine Bernstein. She lets me share her name because I share the story. And she said, She was afraid to go to Sierra Leone because everything's supersized and she's afraid of bugs. I said, well, great. All the bugs are huge. The snakes are huge. (laughs) And she said, oh, great. And she said, I've never left the country. And I said, no problem. She goes to Sierra Leone with a group of other students and she comes back and presents to the parent organization at our school. And she said, we break our iPhones at parties to get the new iPhone this, to get the new iPhone that. She said, I go to Sierra Leone. She said, we have a water bottle. Here's one, for example. And kids use it as a toy. They can go to the pump to fill it up with water. She said, we have all these things in America and it's never enough. She said, kids in Sierra Leone use an empty water bottle as a toy. They're so happy. And she said, what's going on with us? Mm -hmm. And I think that was one of the most powerful moments um, connecting with this young girl and 
having her explain about Sierra Leone might not have all these material things because it went through an 11 year civil war. Mm -hmm. Yet this high school student is learning so much and appreciating community, family, working together and the importance of that Um, rather than just having all these tangible things and it, it was really special. So tell me a little bit more about uh, Sierra Leone rising, what you're doing yeah. there, how you're making an impact. Yeah. Thank you for asking. Our, our nonprofit is Sierra Leone rising and we're working in public health, education, technology, and female empowerment. And we're really focusing this year on clean drinking water. And this year and probably for the next five hopefully five only, but we'll see years. Mm -hmm. And I say five only because we'd like to have clean drinking water in the entire country. So my uncle's the new president of the country. My family runs a chiefdom of 70,000. And we really are mobilizing, working together of how do we actually execute this? We're working with World Hope, a nonprofit who helps dig wells and only works with people on the ground Um, So they actually get extra jobs and so on. And it really is going to impact the provinces who don't have access to clean drinking water and help people um, avoid waterborne diseases and so on. So I studied classical theater dance and have done a lot of diversity, equity, inclusion work for the past 11 years. I did not study (laughs) how to do water wells in a developing country or any of this. But what I've learned is when we set our mind to something, and we start sharing it, people start showing up to help. And it's so powerful to have people come together and start working together. So that's one of the main goals we're working on this year is having clean drinking water in Sierra Leone. And our goal is to get that progress moving and to have clean drinking water in the next five years. Um, Additionally, we're working on solar lanterns so kids have access to light so they can do homework and read and their families can do things together in the evenings. Um, And additionally, we're working on sanitary pads because a lot of girls drop out of school globally due to their menstrual cycle because they don't have access. Mm -hmm. And so we're working with Days for Girls and the Pad Project to get washable, reusable pads, believe it or not, that are really sustainable and help the girls stay in school because they're the ones raising the kids and raising the families. So we need these young girls to have their education equally as anybody else in the community. So these are the things that we're working on right now um, within Sierra Leone. So how did you first find out that you were, were princess Sarah Culberson? So when I was in, after college, I went on to graduate school and I moved to Los Angeles where I started doing TV and film. And as I was in LA, I said to myself, I want to know more about my biological roots. I want to know who I look like. I want to know medical history. I had found out some information when I was in high school when I was 18. Mm -hmm. I found out that my birth mother, unfortunately had passed away of cancer when I would have been about 11, but I got to see pictures and hear stories. And we both, what I love about this is we both love to sing and dance and act. And no one was ever a stranger, which is exactly growing up. My mom would always say to me, my mom who raised me said, oh my gosh, Sarah, I don't want you to be kidnapped. Because I would walk up to people (laughs) all the time and go, hi, who are you? I always wanted to know about people. And when I heard about my birth mother, that's where I got this personality and who I am, which really touched my heart. Mm -hmm. And as I was in Los Angeles, I wanted to know about my birth father. I wanted to know history, medical history. Who do I look like? And, um, yeah. And I also wanted to know about these, this, these African roots Mm -hmm. that I didn't know a lot about. And so I went on this journey and I had no idea where it was going to take me. And I had to really step into my fear. I was terrified of being rejected. Anytime I feel like we decide to take on something new, it can be very scary. And sometimes we just go, Oh, you know what? I don't want to do that. But I said to myself, I don't want to be 60, 70 or 80 someday and it's too late. Mm -hmm. So I said, I've got to step into this. And I took on, (laughs) I said to myself, I'm going to take on being open, loving and courageous. And no matter what I find out, whether my father wants to meet me or not, I'm going to take this on and I'm going to step into this. So I talked to my friend. I did this class called Landmark Worldwide and I was sitting in the class that's the self-development program. And they said, tell the person sitting next to you where you're holding back in life. My friend Art was there and he's so wonderful. And he said, Sarah, 
listen, tell me what's happening. Where are you holding back in your life? And I said, well, I'm terrified to find my birth father. And he said, why? I said, I've heard it costs thousands of dollars. I don't know where to begin. And I'm really, really afraid of being rejected. And he said, you know what, Sarah, I understand that. And I understand the fear, but I'm going to help you. I know what a private investigator who won't charge you more than a hundred bucks, your birth father's going to love you. And I said, deep breath. Okay. I'm going to step into that. Call the private investigator three hours, all the information I needed for 25 bucks, not thousands, not even a hundred dollars. Like he thought it would be Wow. four days later, I get a phone call and this woman says, hello, Sarah. This is Evelyn. How are you? And I thought, is this that Jamaican woman I met the other day? Because I couldn't get the dialect. I wasn't expecting to hear from anyone so soon. And she said, I'm your auntie. We received your letter. And I started to cry. I said, thank you so much. I didn't know if I would ever hear from you. I didn't know if I'd ever, you know, see anyone in my family. And she said, said, I was there when you were born. I used to take care of you when your birth mother would go to the grocery store. She said, hold on, hold on. Let me get your uncle on the phone. My uncle gets on the phone. He's, oh, Anna, we are so happy you've been found. Do you know who you are? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm Sarah. He says, you are part of a royal family. Your great grandfather was a paramount chief. Your grandfather, you can be chief someday. You are a princess in this country. Well, <laughs> I thought, princess, no, wait a second. What does that mean? All of my assumptions came up. Do I have to wear a dress all the time? Do I need to be perfect? And I never say a bad word. You know, what does this mean? <laughs> and this whole new world opened up and they said, we're going to contact your father in Sierra Leone. He's going to be so happy to meet you. And I said, okay. And they told me our family runs a chiefdom of 70,000. You can be chief. They, they just shared all of this about this family with me. And I was completely overwhelmed. And the thought of being rejected or the fear of stepping into something new was completely the, I got the completely the opposite result. It was, I was met with love. And that was one of the big things that I've learned on this journey is showing up. Sometimes that's enough. And we don't always know what the outcome will be, but when we show up, amazing things can happen. And that's what started to happen. And I got to meet my birth father. They contacted him. And I got to hear stories about him. And he said, the first thing he said to me is he said, Sarah, please forgive me. I did not know how to find you after you'd been placed in adoption. Your name had changed. Everything had changed. And I said, no, 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 no. I need to ask you to please forgive me because I've been making you wrong my entire life just to protect myself. And I'm not going to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. And he said, okay. And really that moment and that exchange of forgiveness, of letting go, of love and, and embracing each other via the phone, it really provided this whole new, I, I feel like this yellow brick road kind of opened up for new possibilities to open up and emerge. And it's been, um, it's been an incredible journey. It's been an incredible ride. With ups and downs wow. along the way. It's not been perfect, but it's been really wonderful. I wouldn't want it any other way. Absolutely. No, that's amazing. So how long was it between that call and you actually going there and meeting meeting your your family there for the first time? Yeah. So my I spoke to my family in all these, oh, I forgot to tell you, all these wonderful African family members started to call me once they knew I had been found. They're like, oh, hello, Sarah, hello, Sarah. I'm your Uncle Ali, hello, Sarah, I'm your Auntie Jenny. Just all of these beautiful family members just saying, hello, 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 welcoming me to the family. And so we together planned a trip for six months later that December to go to Sierra Leone. And because they said that's a great time for all of us to travel there, people will have time off. So I went with a group of family members to Sierra Leone who are, who I'd never met before African family members. And that's when we arrived there. So it really actually, to be honest, happened quite quickly. The moment I let yeah. go of my anger and decided to step into my fear, everything fell into place. And, and that's the other thing I have to say that I realized everything was already in front of me. I just needed to step into it. Mm -hmm. I needed to be ready. <laughs> and that's something that I've learned. It's like, oh, wow, the things that we're not necessarily always getting to, it doesn't mean it's not there. It's, are we ready for it? And are we ready, ready to step into it? Yeah. So how did your mindset about yourself change from being, you know, a, 
a, a student and somebody who's who's in acting to being a, like what was to being a princess? What was your mindset change? It's not about me. I, I mean, it, it sounds so silly, but so much of my focus was going to audition, showing up and being this. Be, it, it, I had to focus on myself so much in order to produce. Now, granted, we still have to take care of ourselves to do anything in the world. I'm very clear about taking care of ourselves, our mental and physical well-being. But what I realized, my scope expanded. And when I'm moving through life, whatever I do, I, and this is really true. I think about how is that going to impact the work that we're doing in Sierra Leone? How is that going to impact the community? How's it going to impact young kids? If I'm a princess, how do I want young kids to see me operating in the world? It's, it's not all about diamonds and pearls. I mean, Sierra Leone is actually known for its diamonds, actually, but that's not what it's about for me. It's a, really about being an example, being responsible, and, and stepping into something so much bigger than myself that's had me have growing pains. I've really had to expand into someone I didn't know I could be. Mm-hmm. And I'm completely grateful for that, this opportunity. Um, as challenging as it can be sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, no, I, I love it. And, um, you know, I know when you go speak at corporate events, a lot of times you talk about diversity and inclusion, where does that connection come from, from where you are? I mean, obviously your own past is very diverse, not just from, you know, you talk about being biracial, but also coming from two different countries. I mean, honestly, being transracially adopted into an all white family, being biracial, and then also having this African family and a white American family is, I mean, that's a diversity and inclusion journey within itself. <laughs> it, it truly is. Um, and then also working in D, E, and I, and B. I added, we've added the B a yes. lot in this work, diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging, which I think is so powerful. Because when I talk in corporate America or corporate anywhere, because I speak internationally as well, um, one of the things that I've really discovered inside of the, the B part, the belonging, as a kid in a family looking so different, navigating the world, not even in my family, but in the community, when you feel like you belong, you can do anything. That's what I really realized. When you have a safe environment, whether it's a work environment, a community, um, whatever it is, your family, and you feel safe and you belong the acceleration in what you do in your life can go through the roof. And when I was co-writing with my writing partner, the book I co-authored, my writing partner said to me, <laughs> I can't believe I'm sharing this, but she, she said this to me. She said, Sarah, we need to find some of your challenges because if we just talk about all of your successes, people are going to hate you. And, and I'm not saying that to go, wow, look at me. But one, I was an overachiever because one, I didn't look like everybody else. So I was trying to fit in. But two, I also had a safe, loving environment and community that embraced me so much that I was able to reach a lot of my goals. All of this journey has really helped me. And I've worked in education for 11 years working with students and having kids from all different backgrounds look at diversity, equity, and inclusion and belonging, whether they're Asian Pacific Islander, whether they're part African-American, multiracial African-American community, LBGTQ+, there were all these different groups of folks and how do we create belonging for everyone and when we do have that sense of belonging and talk about action steps to create that and also ways of listening that are really powerful and communicating to help create that kind of space because literally in corporations revenue can go through the roof because of the culture I was able to succeed in a lot of different ways because of the community that surrounded me, even though I looked different, felt so different, but I was able to be lifted in a way that had me be able to hit goals that I didn't even know I had. And I think if we provide that kind of space inside of a community and also learn about each other's cultures, which doesn't always happen, but when we actually learn about each other inside of that journey, it creates such a powerful sense of belonging that. I think you can only go up in a beautiful way. What's a so. safe way to learn about someone else's culture? That that's one of the things I think <laughs> there's a worry that like, hey, you know, what is this? Making I, assumptions. Yeah, and because you can really easily cl- cross that line from you know that offending someone 
uh, like for me, I, I love learning about different cultures. I know we talked about that a little bit before the interview, but, but for a lot of people, there's a fear around that. What would you tell that person? I would say step into that fear and you, when you are uncomfortable, you're in the right place. I worked with, um, had a long conversation with the former CEO of at and I was um, uh, talking with him and he said, I know when I'm uncomfortable, I'm in the right place. And it's like, that's part of the journey. Now, worrying about offending someone, I get it. And you might, <laughs> I might, I do this work and I have to check myself. None of us are all in the clear and going to say things perfectly. As a, as a woman and as a woman of color, I'm still constantly learning. But if we don't take the steps to learn, it's it's not going to make a difference. Mm-hmm. I, I had a student, here's a, a silly example, <laughs> but I worked with, the, I had the student at, um, at the Oakwood School and I love food. I love food. I love eating. Food is also sometimes they say one of the generic, not always the best ways to connect with the culture, but it happened. I was talking to the student, she's Chinese, and I was talking about dim sum, how much I love dim sum and all these different foods that are part of the Chinese culture. And she was so taken aback that I knew about all these. And what happened in that moment, now this was organic. She just started sharing with me about her um, grandfather and about how he was directing Bruce Lee in a movie back in the day. And and she started to tell me the history of the movie and he happened to be shot in that movie or whatever happened. I don't know the story or whatever happened with him, but she opened up. I learned about her grandparents. I learned about her life. And I was just saying that I liked dim sum. I mean, that sounds so silly. Yeah. But what I'm saying is because I actually learned slightly a little bit about, I mean, someone who's Chinese, might say, listen, all she knew was about dim sum, but it opened a whole world of conversation through something as simple and maybe as silly, but as beautiful as food. Mm -hmm. And it connected us in such a deep way. And the next thing I knew, I knew all about her family because I just started talking with her about something that is very important in the Chinese culture. I also learned in talking with her and other students that they said, you know, we don't really identify as Asian. We identify as Korean or Vietnamese or Japanese. And Asian is kind of this huge conglomerate that we really don't completely identify with. So I just learned a lot through just exploring. So I know I'm talking a lot, but I just wanted to say that I think we can get uncomfortable and I could have said the wrong thing, but I was willing to try and learn and it ended up being this beautiful connection. Um, I've learned that a lot of people from different cultures, when you start talking with them about things that, you know, from their culture, they feel so honored because they're, wait, you know, about this, you know, about (laughs) part of who I am and what's important to me. It's huge. Very often you'll be more surprised at how grateful and happy people are than being upset. And one last one, what's, what's a good thing to learn in uh, Mende? Like, so I was like, like <laughs> Boa and Bisea or BCA. And, and so like, what, like, how do you say, how do you say like, hello or thank you or something? Let's just teach us a little bit of Mende. So to say, Boa, Bisea, Kawiena is how are you? And then I'm fine, Kawin Goma. And then my favorite one that I think is easier for people to learn. And that's so beautiful is thank you. And that's Bisea Ka. Bisea Ka. Can you- BCA Ka. That's BCA-ka. thank you. Nice. Yeah. nice. So well, well, I want to thank you, BCA Ka, for having me. <laughs> well, BCA Ka, for being on. We really appreciate it. So, on behalf of uh, Premier Speakers and National Speakers, uh, Princess Sarah Culberson, thank you so much for joining us here on the Beyond Speaking Podcast. Thank you for joining us for the Beyond Speaking Podcast. To learn more about today's guests, go to beyondspeak.com. Make sure to leave a review and subscribe wherever you listen.